Well, hello and welcome to the Dream Highway podcast, the show that's here to inspire you to go after your dreams and most importantly, make the most of the journey every step of the way. This is episode 76 and I'm your host, Steve Pedersen. Today, I have a wonderful and amazing new friend joining us. His name is Frank Macri. Frank is the founder of Thriving Coach Academy. When he started his own journey as a coach over seven years ago, Frank did not have any other prior business experience or a large online following. Yet, he discovered a unique process that allowed him to take his business from zero to multiple six figures before turning 30, making him one of the most successful millennial coaches in the industry. Now, Frank has trained and mentored over a thousand individuals looking to start their own coaching practices. He is also the host of the Life Coaching Secrets podcast. Frank, welcome to the Dream Highway. It's awesome to be here. Thanks for having me. For sure. Yeah, so great to to connect with you. Uh, Frank and I had a great conversation just a couple of days ago, and I'm like, I am so geeked for our conversation today. Um, Frank, I, I want to just start out in your intro. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you're one of the most successful coaches or successful millennial coaches in the industry. Now, the things that I, I this obviously this is not you know geared towards you. I'm just saying things that I've heard. It seems like millennials are always the brunt of jokes. <laughs> you know? <Seems> to be <laughs> right? so true. Now, well. There could be many, many reasons for that. I was actually thinking about this the other day, how, because there's a lot of talk about Gen Z now, and it seems like there's this positive impression of Gen Z, and, oh, they're so self-aware, and they're so emotionally intelligent, and I think, wow, millennials <laughs> didn't really have that impression when yeah. we became a generation that people started to coin and term. Um, but, you know, I do think that I like to talk sometimes to a millennial audience because I think a lot of millennials who are now, I guess, at the ages of, you know, their early 30s all the way into their, you know, 40s, early 40s, a lot of millennials at this point have gone through certain career um, choices and not quite hit on the one that fulfills them. So mm -hmm. I got into the coaching industry for, uh, at a very early age. I was in my early 20s and I'm so grateful that I joined at the time I did. And I really mm. do encourage more millennials. I think no more millennials now are realizing how impactful and successful and stable a career is as a life coach. Um, so it's really cool to see, like when I got started, it was mostly people of older generations, like that mm. baby boomers and Gen X. But now it's really cool to see a lot of millennials are thinking, oh, actually, yeah. I think life coaching is really for me. No. Yeah, well, and you know, it's interesting, not only millennials, but it seems like life coaches in general are often the brunt of jokes, right? <laughs> oh, it's been, yeah, yeah, and it shifted so much when I got started, you know, now over seven years ago, because when I got into it, there was this perception, like, is that for real? Is that really, you know, a right. real career? And are you just yeah. a glorified best friend that gets <laughs> right. paid? <laughs> So right. I, I heard all of that. And I also heard stories of people having very successful coaching businesses. So when I got into the industry and, and began, you know, getting my coaching business up and running, it's been really fascinating to see how the perception has evolved over the years. Mm -hmm. Like now I just spoke to my, my um, eye doctor yesterday and he asked me, what do you do? And I said, I'm, I train life coaches. I've been in the life coaching industry for seven years. And mm -hmm. he was impressed he's like wow that's really cool that's really interesting so a lot of people are now realizing you know that there's so much p potential in the coaching industry yeah. um the per the perception has shifted a lot it used to be the end of a joke like oh what are you a life coach or something but <laughs> but now people are seeing that it is a very lucrative and also practical career path yeah yeah for sure yeah i mean i i you know, you see it in movies all the time or TV shows where it's like, oh, yeah, I've got my life coach. And it, it's like yeah. almost a, maybe in the day uh, back when, the, you know, people had a therapist. As a matter of fact, I was watching a presentation last night online and this guy was saying that he had a therapist and he had to follow that up with, 
yeah, I have a therapist that, you know, like there's still a bit of a stigma around that whole thing. So um, anyhow, we're that maybe that's a couple of the uh, hurdles and obstacles that we have to overcome is just what are people's perceptions of, you know, millennials and life coaches and these kinds of things like, yeah, we're actually doing some legitimate <laughs> work in the world here. Well, like the thing is, I realized when I got started, I was fresh out of college. I knew that I wanted to help people. I knew that I wanted to work with mental health. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't so drawn to therapy as a career option because I knew that therapists really are constrained in how they could structure their mm -hmm. lifestyle and sure. what they could charge and all the regulations with that. Yeah. So I heard about life coaching just from searching around online and it was really cool to see how all of these coaches were creating and designing their own businesses mm. in all these unique ways. So I thought, okay, if I could be my own boss and earn whatever I want to earn, but also do meaningful work, work that yeah. I feel really proud of, work that's truly making a positive difference on the world, then I'm all in, sign me up. Yeah. So I knew that people were going to have judgments and, and their own opinions and it was a theme in my life for so long to try to avoid that and bypass people's judgment. So mm. for many years before I became a coach, I was very insecure about the way I looked, the way I sounded and mm. all other things about my personality that I would try to, you know, just be a chameleon and have everyone accept me and please everybody. And I realized that you really can't please everyone. People are going to have opinions of you no matter what. Yeah. So when I realized that, you know, people are going to judge you no matter what path you take in life, I realized that I have a choice. I can choose to take a path where I'm playing small, not living to my potential, not going after my dreams and have people judge that version of me. Or I could go after mm. my dreams, live a big full life, be very successful and fulfilled and have people judge that version of me. So I decided yeah. I would rather people judge the big confident version of me than the small insecure version of me. And that was one of the biggest leaps that I got over to then pursue life coaching. And mm. I never looked back. I, I realized that, you know, you could be the juiciest peach on the tree, but there's always going to be people that don't like peaches. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there comes a point and <laughs> There comes That's a point great. where we need to think how much, how much weight do we really want to give to other people's opinions mm. of you and whose yeah. opinions really matter, right? Yeah. So um, I, after doing a lot of this inner work, the, the most important question that I asked and my, myself, and I also asked my um, co clients that I've worked with is what is your opinion of you? Mm. What's your opinion of you? Have yeah. you decided on that opinion? Or is it just a reflection of what everyone else thinks about you? And I realized that we're not taught to, to come up with a, an opinion of ourselves. So when you can actually decide what is your opinion of you, then all of a sudden everyone else's opinions don't carry so much weight. It would be yeah. like if I, if I said to you, Steve, if I was like, you know, Steve, you have really ugly purple hair. <laughs> you, would, you would just laugh. Right, like, which I am. <laughs> <laughs> what you like what are you talking about right because you know that you don't have purple hair so i don't even saying, have hair period you don't even i know you don't even have hair <laughs> so it's like if you're um if someone were to come up to you and say you know i think you're really selfish or i think you're far, full of yourself or you know i think that you know you're very greedy then how does that sit with you and this goes for all your listeners right sure. because if you already if you didn't believe that about yourself Yep. It would be just as silly as someone saying you have purple hair, assuming you yeah. don't have purple hair, exactly. right? So what if you can have that same reaction when someone says something about you that just doesn't align with how you see yourself, right? right. All of a sudden, so much life opens up when you can just get over other people's criticisms yeah. and thoughts about you yeah. and just start living a life where you know who you are and you have your back on that opinion. Yeah. Yeah. So when somebody says, what are you, a millennial life coach or something, you can confidently say, well, you know, as a matter of fact, I am, and I am a pretty darn good one. Is it my, you know? Yeah. 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 I'm just like, actually I, I am. And it's so yeah. fun. And this, there's like no career path I would rather take. So like yeah. when I got into this, uh, I, of course I, you know, got proper mentorship, proper training and built up my business. And then when I had my own success as a life coach, that's how I was 
really meeting people as a life coach. I was coaching people of all backgrounds on all kinds of things. When my business began to take off and have momentum, people began to now ask me, okay, how did you get into this industry? And how does one get started? Yeah. So I thought, what if I could lay out step-by-step -step the exact yeah. frameworks that I used as someone who considers themselves an introvert? Like I would not say that I am uh, like an extroverted person. Uh, I'm someone that had a, and still have anxiety come up for me at times. Mm -hmm. And I also didn't have an MBA or business experience before this. So how can I make it so simple that anyone with the desire to help people anyone with the curiosity to serve and under, help people understand their own brains a little bit could do wildly successful in mm -hmm. this career. And that's what led to making Thriving Coach Academy. And it's been beautiful to see that, you know, it's worked for not just like my, my path hasn't worked for just me, but it's also been able to work for the you know thousand plus coaches yeah. I've been able to train. Let's, Let's back up a little bit and just talk about how, like, even all of this came about. So, because I'm imagining, you know, as a kid, you weren't thinking, "Hey, I want to be a life coach when I grow up." Um, and then you went, you went to college, and what was your degree? I studied psychology, okay. and I I was first a computer science major and realized that was absolutely not for me. But then a, a <laughs> friend of mine was, was studying psychology. So I picked up her psychology textbook and I started browsing through And This was my first time being introduced to the subject. Okay. And I was, I was so captivated every, mm. every page just, I was more and more immersed. So yeah, I decided something resonated with you, something, something resonated. And immediately I said, I'm switching everything and I'm going to study psychology. But as I got into psychology classes, a lot of them were focused on what was wrong with people. <laughs> You know, yeah. like yeah, yeah, yeah. Illness, illnesses of the brain and mental disorders and how to treat them. But then I took this one class called positive psychology, mm -hmm. which was very, very different. It was all about how can you take a functional, successful person and help them get to an optimal level in their life? Mm. Where does the, where's the support for that group of people? Yeah. Okay. And so and when, what's, I just want to interject. What's really fascinating yeah. about that is that I think, well, well, maybe let me ask your opinion on this. Where do you think most people fall? Do they fall in a, in a place where I'm broken and I don't know if I could ever get fixed mm -hmm. or is, and is maybe there's a very small percentage of people that are sort of firing on all cylinders, so to speak, but don't yet realize, hey, I could take it higher. What's your perception of that sort of dispersion, if you will? Of so, so from what I've understood, at any given point, there's roughly about 10% of the population that is going through some kind of mental disorder where mm. that could be treated at, with a, the support of a counselor, a therapist, or a psychiatrist. But then there's the other 90% of the population that doesn't necessarily have a mental illness that they have to work through in order to move forward in their life, right? So there's this huge group of people that are not necessarily needing to work with a therapist. And also I'm not, you know, in, in any way discrediting a therapist's work. I love therapy and I've, I've been someone that has, you know, worked with therapists in the past. It's been very helpful when it was addressing what it needed to address. Mm -hmm. So you know, growing up, I thought if you're ever stressed out, you just go talk to a therapist about it because that's the, the professional to help you. But then I realized that it really depends on what kind of stress you're going through, right? So if you are going through stress that is keeping you in a dysfunctional state, you can't get out of bed in the morning. You're having panic attacks throughout your day. Um, you're not showing up to your life at all. That's a sign that you would really benefit from working with a therapist. But if you're just feeling stuck, like you're mm. successful in your life, but maybe you're a little bit stuck in one area and you're looking for a way to move forward. You're looking for a result that you haven't been able to achieve in your life. Yeah. You would much more benefit from working with a coach who's trained to know how to move people forward. So there's a little bit of overlap in therapy and coaching, mm -hmm. right? There's a little bit of overlap in the sense that, you know, if someone is going through anxiety, if they're going through moments of low energy or sadness, even they still could benefit from working with a coach. Okay. Right. So it's okay. If you're someone that has anxiety and just low moments in your life, that's, that's what makes you human, right? And as a, as a coach myself, I still have moments of anxiety and low, low days where mm. I talk to coaches yeah. uh, and I still work. I think all great coaches should absolutely have 
and work with coaches. Yeah. So that's really the main difference. And the other main difference is around the actual process that clients go through. So with therapy, it's more about healing, healing wounds from the past. So you'll spend mm-hmm. more time talking about childhood and trauma that you went through. Coaching doesn't focus much on the past. It's really about where are you now and where do you right. want to be and how could we bridge that gap? Yeah, so there's a lot of focus on what's your vision and the ultimate result you want. So like when yeah. a client starts working with a coach, you're not going to ask them, okay, well, let's, let's go back to your childhood and examine right. where it started. It's really, right. what's the results that you want that you haven't achieved yet? Like it could be what sure. you're trying to find love. If you're trying to get out of a relationship, trying to navigate parenthood for the first time, trying to change careers, start your own business lose weight, gain weight, whatever it might yeah. be, like adjust well, your health. Right. I was thinking in terms of like either like a music student, like a music student or somebody who wants to do weight training, they're not going to yeah. sit and talk about, you know, where they were in the past. They're going to look forward. What are, what are my goals? Um, yeah. and, and I think, yeah, that just helping people to understand that it's, it's okay to hire a coach, uh, to not accept that status quo. Like I think, not that, you know, anybody wants to be in a place of depression, but at least if you're there, you know, you need help. Right. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think a lot of people are okay, just sort of accept accepting the fact that, well, you know, my life isn't a total train wreck. So I guess I'm happy. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Like it's a very low bar. Um, so I, I hear what you're saying on that. Um, what, so you had this, you got a degree then in psychology what was it, what happened between the degree and going into life coaching? There was something that happened there. Tell me a little bit about that. Um, well, after getting the degree, I, I just knew, okay, I want to become a coach. But my big question was, how on earth do I find clients? And mm. how on earth do I coach people with the very little life experience that I have? Sure. Um, so I, I was in my early 20s. And one of the first things I learned is that you don't need to have a lot of life experience to be an amazing coach. Mm -hmm. You just need to know how people's minds work. Mm -hmm. And that is a learnable skill that anyone could, could um, immerse themselves in. And the other thing I realized is that you don't have to even live an extraordinary life to be a great life coach, because I thought, oh, my life's just not interesting or, you know, exciting enough. I realized that even all the coaches that I've trained to this day, a lot of them are ordinary people, but what's extraordinary about them is their, their curiosity for how the mind works. And Mm. what's extraordinary about them is their passion for helping people. Um, So they're ordinary people, but they have this extraordinary willingness to learn the skill of coaching. So I, so I realized for myself, If you're an extraordinary person, but you learn an extraordinary skill, that can lead to incredible success in your life and a lot of fulfillment. So in between my period of, you know, college to getting into it, I, um, like I got, I got properly trained as a coach. And then I actually went overseas to China where I was teaching English and simultaneously building up my coaching business out there. And I saw it really take off and it wasn't by having... I'm sorry. That's, yeah. that's fascinating. Like, okay. So what, what called you to China to teach English? What, like, where did that, I did well, not see that one coming. <laughs> yeah. I, I really was something about China intrigued me and I had never lived in another country before. Um, so I was the, the opportunity pre- presented itself and I thought, well, how fun could this be just to really go out of my comfort zone and, mm. and, you know, be able to ex- learn about another culture and, and I had a blast experiencing yeah. so much of Asia. And what's interesting is a lot of, I mean, it's not easy to just hop across the world and live in China by yourself sure. <laughs> without really knowing the language, but, right. but it helped me build so much understanding of what it takes to succeed as an entrepreneur. And it mm. also, the most revealing thing I got from living in China is the, the moment that I got off of the plane and in Shanghai, it was I had a very unique moment where I was looking around and no one knew me, no one knew my past. And I felt, wow, I could define who I am in this moment and no one would know who I was in the past. I could choose to be whoever I Mm. want to be. So it made me realize that we all have this rule book. This is a concept that we teach our coaches in the academy. 
that everyone walks around with this, you know, this um, figurative rule book on who they should be mm -hmm. and how they should act, what they should say, what they should wear, what they should do. And this holds us back whenever we're looking to grow and transform. So I was carrying around a rule book that had expired. There were pages mm -hmm. that were no longer needed. So I decided to let go of the person I used to be before China, which was someone that was didn't think they had much to offer, didn't think that their voice mattered, um, was very insecure, very much would hide and blend in the background and try not to have the spotlight put on them. And I decided in that moment, I do have something valuable to offer. Mm -hmm. I am here for a purpose. My voice does matter. And there are people out there that I can support. So yeah. when, I, when I created these rules and started giving them life, that's really where I saw things start to, to take off. So you don't have to go across the world and live in China to go through that experience. But what you can start with is you can decide, okay, who have you been up until this point and who do you want to be moving forward? Because you don't have to, con who you were in the past doesn't decide who you need to be in the future. Yeah. So I love, I love the phrase. I tell my coaches this all the time up until today. Right. Yeah. So if you're someone that thinks, oh, I'm just not a confident person, just add the words up until today yeah. and it totally changes. Right. Yeah. Like, okay. That's who you were, but who do you want to be moving forward? I am a person that takes risks. I am a mm. person that honors my calling. I am a person that, you know, follows my intuition. I am a person that shows up and, off, you know, knows that yeah. they have something valuable to offer to the world. Yeah. I love that. That, that reminds me of a, a very similar phrase that my to uh, coach taught me, which was until now. <laughs> I, I love that until yeah. now, until yeah. now, you know, and you, you catch yourself saying things, um, you know, so for example, um, I'm dealing with a little bit of a cold right now. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think those kinds of things play uh, into our, even to our, you know, physical wellness, like, oh, I always get sick this time of year, mm -hmm. you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Until now, <laughs> you Until know what now. I'm saying? Yeah. And it's, it's fascinating, powerful stuff. And I think what's so interesting about what you're saying, recently, uh, there's this phrase that's been coming to my mind a lot. It's this phrase, maybe you're familiar, familiar with it. Uh, it says, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown. Have you ever heard that one? I haven't. And essentially what it's speaking to is that it's the people that know you really well tend to uh it, well it's hard to rise above them um it's a, it was a phrase that jesus said and you know he grew up you know we all grow up somewhere right and we all have yeah. this sort of community that of people that know us right yeah. and they sort of take us for granted and until we go somewhere else go to a different town yeah. where nobody knows anything about us Mm -hmm. You know, then, like you said, we get to define the rules. We yeah. get to sort of redefine who we are there. They don't have like years of preconceived notions yes. um, that they lay upon you. So, for example, for me, obviously, I play guitar, you know, with all the guitars in the background here. Um, and a lot of people know me as a guitar player. And that's it. And so for yeah. them to try to see me as a life coach, you know, and most of the people, you know, that I know, it's like, uh, you know, they're the ones that are kind of make cracking jokes at, you know, life coaches. And so until you get out of that place, I, I love that. I'm glad I asked the question like China, where did that come from? Uh, but sometimes yeah. we need to, like you said, maybe we can't literally go to a country across the world, but how can we, how can we step out of our, um, sort of country, our metaphorical country or community yeah. to, to recreate who we are? How, how's that for a question? <laughs> That's a great question. Well, the first step is looking at your rules, right? So what are the rules you have around who it is that you think you should be? Okay, maybe you have rules around whose opinion of you really matters. Like I should do what my parents think I should do, mm. right? I should be the person my friends want me to be. Uh, I'm more of a follower instead of a leader, right? So these are all just yeah. sentences in our brain. They are not factual. They are just mm. sentences in the brain. They can be deleted. They can be changed. They can be completely removed, right? So yeah. what, are, what are those rules that you have about yourself? The second thing 
is where is a community that you can put yourself in where you can start to reinforce your new rules, your new self-concept. So mm -hmm. when our coaches get started, one of the things I encourage that, well, first of all, it's great to be in a, if you're looking to, you know, be, become anything new in your life, being in a community of others that could receive you that way is helpful. So that's why in the academy, it's very community oriented. It's not just like you're getting coaching skills and you're learning how to coach, but you're also in a community of people that see you as a life coach and they mm -hmm. reinforce that and they allow you to feel at home, like with that yeah. concept of yourself. Love and it. finally, when you are, you know, in the sense of becoming a life coach, you've got to meet new people and you've got to introduce yourself as a life coach. Mm -hmm. And at first, it's going to feel totally weird. And yeah. your brain's going to tell you, who do you think you are? And <laughs> you're not a life coach. And I describe that experience like you're putting on a new pair of shoes for the first time and you know that if they're the right size, you know that they're, you know, a style you like, but it still feels awkward the first few times you put them on, right? It takes a few days maybe to, to really break them in. Mm. So I describe transformation the same exact way, right? You need to allow there to be that awkwardness where you break in your new self-concept in order for it to start to flow. So everything's going to feel inauthentic and everything's going to feel awkward and weird, but yeah. that doesn't mean that you discredit it and go the other way. So one of the episodes on my podcast I have, I talk about false authenticity where mm. people think, oh, it's just not authentic for me to do blank or be blank. Like mm. it's not authentic for me to be a life coach because it feels uncomfortable and different. Sure. So, but, but really what's, what's going on is the person is just afraid and they're labeling their transformation as inauthentic. So one of the things I encourage mm. people to think about when they're looking to grow is, you know, how, how is it, if you might be labeling your transformation as an authentic, you can realize that's a normal process. Like you've got to shed the layer. You've got to have yeah. the, the skin just shed off of you in order for you to emerge and who you've always been. So when I got started, it felt very awkward and weird to call myself a life coach, but still in my bones, I knew that I was born to be a coach. It's hard yeah. to describe. Like a lot of people, yeah. they don't just wake up randomly and decide I want to be a life coach. They realize their whole life has been giving them signs that mm. have actually been pointing them all along to this. And it's not just a sudden occurrence. It's all been preparing them for the moment to actually make it a career. So I knew that even are, are though it sounded some, weird. I'm sorry. Are there some specific signs? Because you mentioned that some of these signs, like, is there, uh, is yeah. it more of a, just an intuitive thing? Like you just kind of know, like, I know I'm in love with this person or are there specific things there's, that. There's, so there's a lot of signs. I've, I've boiled it down to a handful of signs that I've heard time and time again. So one of the signs is if you have a passion for making a difference in people's lives, if mm -hmm. you really like helping people win and helping them achieve goals. Okay. That's one of the clear signs. The second sign is if you're someone that is curious about how people tick. So mm -hmm. you're curious about how people's minds work. You like asking people questions. Maybe sometimes as a kid, you were told you were being a little bit nosy at times. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard stories of our coaches. They say that growing up and even in their adulthood years, people just flock to them and, and open up right away. People just mm -hmm. find comfort in really opening up about personal things and they never yeah. understood why. <laughs> yeah. um, so th that's a major sign. That is really uh, interesting because I've, I've had a lot, when you, when you said that, I was like, that's really strange. I have had a lot of people, it's not even just tell me, it just seems like people just feel like they can just open up and just gush with me. And I'm like, huh, that, that must be a sign. That's a sign. Not everyone has that experience. Like something yeah. about some people you meet, you're like, I don't really know if I could open up or trust this person. But if it's, it's a great sign that you're a natural born coach, if people do or would open up to you, because you're probably really curious and non-judgmental. So that's the second sign. And the third mm. sign is if you're a really attentive listener. So maybe when people are talking, you get this sense that there's more going on, or, you know, if people say, oh, I'm doing fine, but you feel like there's a little bit more to the story. So if you, if you pick up on the subtle cues, that's also a great sign that you're born to be a coach. Mm. Um, in addition to, if you've been, you know, hopping from career path to career path and nothing's quite sit, but you know, you know that the one thing you like about whatever careers you've gone through are that you've enjoyed the interaction you've had with another person. Like a lot of our coaches, uh, they come from all these, like some of them are teachers, some of them are therapists before they become coaches, some of them are lawyers. But interestingly, we also have a lot of hairstylists. So one mm -hmm. of our graduates, Christopher, he was telling me when, when he was enrolling that 
he would spend so many years cutting people's hair. They're sitting in the chair. Mm, but what he yeah. really liked about being a hairstylist was the way he could talk to people and how sure. they open up to him and he could listen, he could ask questions, right? Yeah. So that's when he realized he's been coaching all along. He just needed to have the frameworks to now create a sustainable business out of it. So that's what I tell people, like you've probably yeah. already been coaching in your life, but now let's use your, the signs to translate that into, you know, a career where you can actually you know, help people on that deeper level. And yeah. then I think the other sign is if you are a go-getter in your own life, if you like personal development, you like setting goals, uh, maybe you like reading personal help books or following, you know, podcasts that are related to personal development, right? People who are naturally growth oriented are make amazing coaches and they bring mm -hmm. a lot of integrity to their work because they're people that like to up level their life and start and create new possibilities. So mm -hmm. those are those are really the main signs that you've been a natural born coach all along. And yeah, you've done one all along well. and you just didn't know it. <laughs> yeah, and you just need, to, now the science is like, you have the foundation, now you just need to get the training and the mentorship. So that way you can know what you're doing well, what you're not doing well, and also know how to put the business part together. Yeah, interesting. Um, so we've talked about a couple of different obstacles uh, that you've faced one just being uh, kind of all, all the insecurities yeah. uh, you know that you've dealt with and then there's the awkwardness of getting into uh, you know and I think about like my when you said the awkwardness I thought about my daughters when they were learning how to walk yeah and, you know that's that's a very awkward thing for them you know but that it wasn't that, I mean that's just the what you have to go through and of course they're going to learn to walk you know yeah. but it's a natural step can you think of any other maybe obstacles, maybe once you got into doing mm -hmm. your, your passion for doing life coaching, what are some of the other obstacles that have presented themselves that uh, just along the way, maybe even current obstacles? Um, I know you mentioned earlier that, you know, we all have days where we feel anxious and feel these different things, but yeah, uh, any anything specific that jumps out like, yeah, this is definitely an obstacle. I think one of the obstacles when I was getting started as a coach is thinking that this is a big one. I love this question. Thinking that I had to go at it alone was a big obstacle. Mm. You know, that I had to create this business from scratch and I had to figure it all out by myself. And I would pride myself. I had this rule about myself that I should, it's easier to do things by myself. I should mm. just figure it out, but I can't rely on people. All of those rules did not serve me. Mm, they had to yeah. go. And I think it's maybe embedded in our culture a little bit to be very individualistic mm -hmm. and to, you know, be this trailblazer and, you know, hmm. be the one that's climbing up the mountain, getting to the top and, you know, being the, the, the conqueror and all of this. So all right. the I guru at like, the top of the mountain. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I, I realized, wow, I don't think my problem is that there's nothing wrong with me. There's nothing wrong with the industry. There's nothing wrong with the social media algorithms. Like, it's <laughs> just that I need support, right? So I love the quote, like, um, failure we can do alone, success requires support. Mm. One of my favorite quotes. So wow. if you have, whether you want to be a coach or not, if you have a big mission in your life, it's going to require big support. Mm. And you deserve the best possible support you can get. So the next time, if you feel stuck with a goal, instead of just banging your head against the wall and thinking, why is this not working? Why is this not working? Mm -hmm. What if you asked yourself, how can I get support? Who can guide me? Who can make this process simpler for me? Mm -hmm. Right? So I realized that if I wanted to be successful, I needed to open myself up to receive support and get proper mentorship and training, right? So it wasn't that there was anything wrong. I just needed to open myself up to receive support. Got it. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I love that. And you did, you mentioned uh, the social media algorithm and it just triggered this, this thought, this question that I have to ask because it seems like uh, sort of the prescription for coaches for success is you have to post some kind of motivational quote on social media every day. Uh, <laughs> what, what do you think about that? Well, you certainly don't, <laughs> don't have to do any of that, <laughs> but I know that that's the perception. Um, yeah. and that's certainly what I thought too. I thought that, you know, I needed to be 
very high energy, inspiring, positive, positive, positive all the time. And I found that that was actually very toxic to think that we ever, another rule that we have is that we should always be happy and that, you mm-hmm. know, life is about just being happy all the time, which is not true. Um, so what, what we teach our coaches is the way, the best way to grow your business is really two things. One is organic marketing. Okay. This means not paying for ads, not, you don't need to pay for any advertising, especially your first 200 K as a coach. So organic marketing is simply meeting people and having genuine conversations Mm. where you tell them that you're a coach and you get to know them a little bit, see if you can offer support. And it really is that simple. And we give Mm. our coaches like templates of things they could use to guide those conversations, even if they're a little introverted, which Mm. certainly has been my story. So having authentic conversations with people, this is how I built my business. So the first, you know, 200 K I actually I made 300K in one of the like early two year phase, I made 300K and I didn't spend a dime on any advertising. Mm. It came from meeting people, having genuine conversations and making offers to help them. Um, So we live on this planet with almost 8 billion people. Doesn't matter where you live. There are people, as long as people are willing to grow, there are people that are willing to be coached. So the first part is just organic marketing. The second part is being a premium coach. And this is what I think makes our school so unique because a lot of coaching business support groups will tell you that you should, you know, just start selling your coaching by the hour. So a lot of coaches will charge, you know, $50 or a hundred dollars an hour. And and it makes sense why some might think this is the way to do it because they see therapists do it. Therapists are required Mm. to only charge by the session, right? There's regulations to that and they can't charge a certain amount. With coaching, we don't have those regulations. We have a lot more freedom. Mm. So what we teach our coaches to do is confidently charge a premium being like, you know, 2,000, 3,000, 5,000, 10,000 per client. And it doesn't necessarily matter how many sessions you have, but you want to enroll someone in a package of coaching sessions so they can have momentum and so they can continue to see themselves get results. Mm. So if you think of the math, right, if you want to make, $10,000 a month as a coach, which is a great starting milestone that a lot of coaches have. You can think about, okay, if I charge $100 per session, that's a lot of sessions that you have to sell, (laughs) right? That's if my 100 sessions in a month versus if you were to sell, uh, if you were to sell a coaching package for $2,500, you need four clients in a month. Or if you charge it for 3000 then you only need, you know, we'll say four, three or four a month, mm-hmm. right? Now, out of the 8 billion people on the planet, you just need to invite three or four of them to work with you per month yeah. to make, to make $10,000. So like, this is not, right. this is not yeah. rocket science. Right. It's just about yep. meeting people. And that's really like so much of the struggle I got myself caught into was I made it very complicated. Mm. I thought I needed to you know, have all these funnels set up and pay for these ads and have all of these like, like high quality tech and equipment. Mm -hmm. And I took, all I did was I went and talked to people and I was, I was the person I always were curious, interested in them. Yeah, And you'd be amazed at what can be opened up just by having an authentic conversation. So that's really the key. (laughs) I love it. I love it. And, uh, what, what, so one of the things that we're talking about, and I, I just want to make a quick analogy to something, and that is, um, you know, because you mentioned a couple of times how therapists are sort of confined within a framework. Yeah. And, and when you said that, what it made me think of was I used to be a, a barista at Starbucks. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Starbucks is a major worldwide corporation, and they have literally like manuals on how much ice you are to measure out into a cup for a frappuccino you know what i'm saying whereas you know you own your own coffee shop you do whatever you want you know so i i think it's yeah, yeah it it's a great uh opportunity um you know as coaches to kind of create not only their own lives but kind of call the shots with their own business um but we are talking about money here. And I know for a lot of people, that is a huge hurdle. Like they'll be like yeah. getting up all kinds of momentum and then hit that wall of, oh, I got to yeah. make money. And like, there's yeah. like, I've got to make a lot of money. Like, can't I just be happy? Like, I don't know. I got to get afraid when I think of a lot of money. Don't, won't I become corrupted? You know, won't my soul, yeah. you know, do I have to sell my soul to make that kind of money? Like, 
what kinds of, and obviously you've worked with, you know, um, coaches or who are students to become, maybe overcome those hurdles as well. Has that been a hurdle for you? Has that been a hurdle for some of your clients? Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's amazing how we all have a relationship to money. And it is essential that any entrepreneur look at that relationship. So when I grew up, my parents would often argue about money. And it led to a lot of conflict and fighting. And eventually they got, they got divorced. And we even lost our family home mm. as a result of the divorce. So as a child, my understanding of money was that money was bad because it led to terrible things happening with my family. I really thought money is what ripped my family apart. Mm. So I had a very unhealthy and negative relationship to money. So when it came to charging for my coaching, I had a lot of guilt come up because I felt really bad. And I also had a lot of shame you know, am I a bad person mm. because now I'm taking money from someone else? And I realized that all of that was not true. I was mm. just, I just had a terrible relationship with money. Hmm. Yeah. So what I needed to do is look at that and, and really think, okay, so is it true, right? This is, we always get this question. Is it, how true is it? right? That you are selling your soul by <laughs> making more money. And I thought, okay, right. something like that is so opposite of the truth because my gift, my calling is to coach people. So if I withhold that, that's selling my soul. That's just not honoring my truth. Yeah. Right. And there's also the you know, like idea of abundance. I mean, it's our birthright to thrive and to, and to, you know, experience life to the fullest and we can't give what we don't have so when i say charge a premium sometimes people go oh well then is it just you care about the money and what i like to explain is that when you confidently charge a premium for your coaching you actually create a container for your clients to get the most amazing results mm -hmm. all right like think about the last major investment you made okay mm -hmm. like if you were to, if you were to pay you know, 20 bucks for something or $20,000 for something, which one are you going to pay more attention to? Sure. Right. Yeah. So yeah, when yeah. people invest, they are also investing their energy and attention into getting a result that they ultimately want. Right. So when coaches have this guilt, you have to remember that you're not taking money because money is a replenishable resource. It doesn't mm. disappear. Right. Yeah. We are able, we are resourceful beings and we're able to create money. Um, so the money doesn't go away and you're not putting someone in a bad place by receiving money because they're investing in transformation, right? Yeah. Like you're actually enabling so much more for them in their life because they're investing in the process. And because you're well-resourced as the coach and you're not worrying about paying your own bills, you're going to show up more fully and present and engaged to your client. So this is what I mean when I say you create the perfect container for your client to get amazing results. A lot of coaches assume that it's probably easier to charge less. It'll be easier to, to find clients and mm. they won't feel bad. But listen, you can charge a dollar for your coaching and there are still going to be people who think you should be ch not charging at all, that mm, you should be yeah. giving it away for free. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so like when you are able to confidently charge a premium, you're actually inviting someone like I've had people cry as they invest, not like tears mm. of sadness, but tears of like gratitude. And yeah. I've had clients say, thank you for charging for, for allowing me yeah. to invest in myself because my whole, like one of our um, coaches, Jules, you know, mother of three kids, deeply connected to her family, really put them first for a lot of her, her adult life. And when she enrolled in our program, she had tears coming down her eyes and mm. she said, I don't remember the last time I invested in me mm, and yeah. some, there was like this part of her that was also like, I don't know. I'm feeling guilty about that. We have a rule about money. It's bad to invest yeah. in ourselves. Yeah. It's selfish. But when she realized it is that when she gets to like invest in herself and grow, she is becoming an example of what's possible for her mm -hmm. family and for her kids. So it doesn't do them any service for her to put herself last right? When she can really put herself first, she has more to give to her family yeah, because she, right. you can't give what you don't have. Right. 
So that's a, money yeah, that's is, a great, great. Po- I was just going to say, that's a great point of modeling for your family, like investing in yourself. Like if they see it, cause you're modeling something. <laughs> and if you're modeling, yeah. Hey, you know, burn yourself out for other people and don't take care of yourself, then they're going to follow that um, yeah. to, to their demise as well. Yeah. Like think about the last time that you've been grateful to invest in something right? Like that is the experience that you allow your clients to have as a coach. Okay. So like I tell our coaches, what if instead of feeling guilty, you could receive with gratitude, right? You can receive with gratitude. And because if you cut yourself off from receiving, you're also cutting off someone's opportunity to also receive something important Mm -hmm. to them to give, right? So if someone thinks about, well, I just feel really bad, you know, am I being greedy and shallow and materialistic? Like these are all inaccurate and false rules that need to be looked at because really, you know, it is such a kind hearted, like, I feel like I would be doing someone a disservice by undercharging Mm. because then I'm, they're less invested. I'm less resourced. So it actually does them a disservice, right? And like the other big part, I was telling one of our coaches this the other day, when you confidently learn how to charge a premium and then get yourself to making at least 10K per month as a coach, which is for most people enough to sustain them very comfortably. Now you're able to give back so much more for free, right? So I I have like so much free content. I have the Life Coaching Secrets podcast. I have my Instagram. I have so many sources online where I can now give back for free and help tens of thousands of people because I'm well-resourced. But if I was, you know, stuck in this scarcity, fear-based mindset around money, yeah. then I would actually be giving back less. So if someone is, you know, spiritual, religious, if you feel like you're a giving person, but you're telling yourself, well, the only way to give is if I give something for free, that might be a thought to look at, right? Because mm-hmm. I feel like because I've been able to charge and receive money without guilt, I've been able to give back tenfold. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's, that's so huge. Um, I I appreciate that perspective. And I, I especially appreciate when you, when you made the comment about, you know, if you spend $20 for something versus 20,000, you know, the thing that came to my mind is um, I have a guitar, a classical guitar that I spent, you know, maybe 500 bucks on and I love it, but I also have another one that I spent. uh, Well, it's a $5,000 guitar it, it hasn't arrived yet, but I'm, I'm already planning in my mind, like that thing is never going to come out of its case except yeah. for when I play it. And I'm going to treat that thing like pure gold, you know? Yeah, so there's, exactly. you definitely, you definitely value those things. Um, this is, can I, meant. can I share one more thought about this? Please, absolutely. This yeah. Okay, Cause this is such a juicy <laughs> topic. Um, so there's the rule we have, like if, if I enjoy something, I shouldn't get paid for it. That's another rule. Because mm, some, yeah. some people, when they get into coaching, they're like, I just love coaching people so much. It feels weird to get paid. So there's a rule that I shouldn't get paid to do things I love, mm. right? What if it was not true? And what if it could be true that you can get paid well to do work that you love? You can get paid well to do something you are naturally good at, right? So there's mm. that whole part of it. And yeah. then there's also like, this idea like we're doing any service to the world by staying broke right Mm. some people this this i don't know how this is going to land with your audience but hopefully they'll stay with us here because i want to pose the idea just i say like try on the thought what if you could try on the thought that the best way for you to make an impact on the world is by making as much money as possible Mm. right it, I believe it's one of the best things that you can do if you want to make a difference in the world is to allow yourself to become wealthier, right? Because mm-hmm. if you're, if you look at the world and you think, wow, there's a lot of suffering in the world and I don't want to add to the suffering by taking away someone's money and making them suffer, right? Mm-hmm. You just got it a little backwards right. because if you stay broke or if you don't keep yourself well-resourced, you're not helping with any, any of the problems of the world by, you know, keeping yourself broke. But when you do allow yourself to receive more, you become, you become more available because you have more option and reach. Okay. So money's like a magnifier. Like it's just going to magnify what's there. And this is one of the, also the biggest beliefs I realized about money. Money doesn't make someone evil. It just magnifies what's already there. 
-hmm. So if you're, if you're a kind, big hearted, compassionate, loving person with more money, your ex expansion of that goes even greater. So you'll have more ways for you to help solve problems in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You'll have ways to make a bigger difference because money allows you to magnify that, right? It's not going to take yeah. away from your, your um, gratitude. And listen, like, are there crummy people with a lot of money? Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. Are, there, are there crummy broke people as well? Yeah, yeah, of course there are, right? So it just goes to show you that it's not about the money. Right. It's about you magnifying your gifts and your reach. And the best yeah. way that you can really do that, if you're someone that really cares, like what's wild to me when some people say like, well, I just really want to, you know, help people, but I don't care about money. I'm like, but mm. money will help you help people <laughs> right, more. Right, exactly. Right, so that they go hand in hand. Yeah, 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 for sure. Well, I, I think I have, I heard, uh, I'm not sure who was, you know, quoted as saying this, you know, I think attribute things, to, you know, like Abraham Lincoln or, or whoever, but they said, uh, uh, you can't help broke people or you can't help poor people by becoming one of them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. And, uh, and, you know, and what's interesting is something that just uh, occurred to me recently. So uh, one of these coaching groups that you had uh, talked about, I'm, I'm in a group like that. And one of the coaches had suggested this book called, uh, I think it's called A Happy Pocket Full of Money. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, uh, it's, I was listening to the audio book. And as I was listening to it, they're just talking about how you can manifest wealth. And yeah. part of my sort of religious beliefs from the past came up and they, and I thought, well, if we mm -hmm. really can manifest anything we want, mm -hmm. why, why is there all of this focus on money? Like, why don't we focus on manifesting other things like, you know, stopping world hunger and, you know, yeah. uh, taking care of the rainforest and, and all these great things. And so I had this conversation with my coach and my coach was like, well, those are very difficult things for one person to, you know, it's like one person isn't going to change the entire world. I mean, you have your outliers out there, your mother Teresa's and your Martin Luther King juniors and all of that. But for the most part, he's like, all of that stuff is very hard to measure. And it's hard to go from just maybe where you're at to a huge, huge leap up to like, Hey, I'm going to save the rainforest, you know, kind of a thing. He said, but yeah. what you can't, and, and what, what it started helping me to realize was that it's not so much a money or a lack thereof. That is the problem. The problem is my belief or my unhelpful mm. belief about mm -hmm. money. And you know mm. what? That's the problem with most everybody. That's the reason oh, yeah. that we have all of these other problems and yeah. so if I change my belief about yeah. money, then other people are going to see that and that will empower them to change yeah. their beliefs about money. Oh and really, what does that all come down to? But a, it's a, a sense of um, just abundance, right? It's a sense yeah. of uh, either scarcity or, and lack versus abundance yeah. and prosperity. And if I can change yeah. my beliefs about that and bring, you know, and it's not just, I think where we get caught up is that we think that we're bringing it in to ourselves mm -hmm. and it's just staying there. Right. You know? And it's not, it's a matter of, you know, Hey, let me be a channel. Can I, can I be a bigger channel, a yeah. bigger pipe? So more blessing, so to speak, can flow through me. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah we're, I like, love it. We're, you, we're like nodding our heads. Like, yeah, you, yeah. We just solved the world's it. problems right there. We did. I mean, <laughs> but you've done the work, which is so good. And, and mm -hmm. listen, it's no one's fault if they have a bad relationship with money. Like I want that to be really clear. Mm, I would yeah. say pretty much everyone has an unhealthy relation. Even wealthy people sometimes have an unhealthy relationship with money. Mm. That's why sometimes people are very wealthy and miserable. Um, yeah. So by hopefully this conversation has helped open people up to realizing like you can make a big difference. You can be a good person and you can also have a lot of money. Like they're not contrasting thoughts. They can right. exist together. Right. And when you're able to allow yourself to receive more, then you'll also allow yourself to give back more. So it all mm -hmm. just comes full circle, right? Yeah. You don't have to have guilt. You don't have, when you receive it, you don't have to have even fear when you spend it. Like I was so it's when we talk about even religion and spirituality, because I know you said your audience identifies a lot with religion. 
I feel like the most spiritual moments of my life have been moments where I've made significant investments in myself. Mm. Interestingly, like the moment I decided to invest in coach training, I mean, this was a five figure investment and I, it confronted me with so much. It confronted me with, you know, my whole life path. Mm. Is this what I want? Am I, you know, am I going to honor this, this nudge that's been there for so long? And I had to have a lot of conversations with myself and the universe and God and really explore that and finally say, yes, I'm going to do it. I'm not going to wait until I feel ready because um, nothing in life, we never feel ready for the things yeah. that transform us. We've got to start before we feel ready. And like the exchange of money was part of that transformation. So I'm mm. really grateful for those moments in life where I've been able to like, really invest in myself because they've up leveled mm. everything for me. Yeah. Yeah. If I did, if I decided to live in fear or guilt and shame around money that I never would have been able to pursue this path and help all the people I've been able to help. And I know our coaches, yeah. they, it's the same for them too. Like they're now off running their own businesses, helping people because they've allowed themselves to yeah. invest in themselves and receive as well. Yeah. That's so huge, man. Like the, all of the, yeah. Cause you don't see that people don't see that. They don't see all of the spiritual gears no, <laughs> shifting and working and grinding to be able to make these outward things possible yeah. and to make them happen oh yep. my gosh frank this has been man i just <laughs> right time flies i feel like we could just keep on talking about this and, and multiple other things um let's tell people where they can find out more about you because i know you have some some free gifts on your website correct yeah i'm so i am the host of the life coaching secrets podcast if anyone searches life coaching secrets um even if you're not interested in becoming a coach there's a lot of you know episodes there to help you um, up level your life, but I certainly have a lot of tips for getting started there. And if, if your listeners want a little VIP access into my coach training program, I'd love to offer that as a gift. So if you go to www.thrivingcoachacademy.com forward slash VIP, short for very important person, VIP, um, you'll be able to make a free account and see screenshots and clips from our actual virtual classroom and also some of the tools that are being used by our highest earning coaches. Excellent. Excellent. Awesome. Um, so what I'll do is I'll put all of that in the show notes for, for this episode. If people forget about that, um, they can easily connect with you there as well. That would be at thedreamhighway.com slash 76 so um, if you're driving in your car, don't stop, you know, and write this stuff down. Just uh, <laughs> check the show notes. We'll get you connected with Frank. Uh, Frank, thanks so much uh, for joining today and sharing your knowledge and wisdom and your heart with uh, the Dream Highway audience. It's been a great time. Thanks so much. And uh, we'll catch you. We'll catch you. Hopefully we'll have another conversation soon. I love it. Thanks so much for having me, Steve. All right. Take care.